and I would please like to remind everybody to please mute yourself in case there's some background noise. I'm going to shuffle everything over here so it doesn't. There we go. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for this opportunity once again to uh, address the Lorquin Society. As some of you know, um, I joined the Lorquin Society back in 1970 when I was just a, a very young lad. And it's always, uh, thanks to Zoom, it's nice to uh, participate every now and again. Um, and Blaine, thank you for giving me this spot uh, in September and uh, share this travel log. As some of you know, uh, Bob Anderson and I went on a uh, cross-country uh, road trip, which I'm calling Beatles Across America, the 2022 tour. I say that because I'm hoping that we can do something again <laughs> here shortly. So uh, let's see. There we go. So there's Bob Anderson. Um, Bob is a uh, research scientist at the Canadian Museum of Nature. I'm a, a research assist, uh, associate at the uh, Virginia Museum of uh, Natural History. Um, Bob is a world-renowned authority on weevils, and for the past several years has really uh, encouraged me, uh, or actually has given me a very new appreciation of these fascinating beetles. Uh, so much so that I've hosted Bob here in Richmond, Virginia several times, and he very kindly not only identified all my weevils, but also uh, 7,000 specimens from Virginia Tech and the Virginia Museum of Natural History too, which was a real boon to both collections. Uh, we're all very lucky to have someone who's so generous with their expertise. <clears throat> Uh, this trip was uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, Canadian Museum of Nature with Bob at the helm, and his goals were to primarily collect additional specimens of known and new species in support of several revisions that he's working on. And he also wanted to take an opportunity to examine uh, the collection of weevils that uh, Charlie O'Brien deposited at ASU. And there's a number of new taxa in there, several of which will be pertinent to an upcoming pop, uh, uh, publication, The Beatles of Canada and the United States, which will be published by CRC Press in 2026. This will be a handbook to the identification of the Beatles of Canada and the US. As for me, uh, my goal was to support Bob and also do some collecting and photography and to take advantage of uh, passing through West Texas. As some of you remember last year, I announced that uh, Margarita Brumman and I have been working on a book, Arizona Beetles, for a few years now, and uh, we've had a major development uh, that happened earlier this year, and I thought I would share it with all you tonight, and that is Arizona Beetles has evolved, and it's now the Beetles of southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico. Not exactly the, the crisp, clean title that it once was, but we now have a publisher. Um, Princeton University Press will publish this book. And uh, as I got to reviewing uh, the uh, di um, distributions for the uh, 2000 plus species of beetles in this book, it became apparent to me that it was more than just a book on Arizona that engulfed the American Southwest and Northwestern Mexico. And uh, we approached Princeton uh, to see if they would be interested in publishing such a book, and they uh, readily jumped at the opportunity. Up to that point, it was going to be a self-published book, and I hated to think that all our hard work was going to wind up being in Margarita's trunk, and she was going to have to sell those books one at a time herself, so we're really pleased with this development. So on July 13th, um, Bob drove down to Richmond from Ottawa, in this fine automobile. Uh, this truck was previously owned by Charlie O'Brien, uh, a weevil specialist. Some of you might recognize the names of Charlie and Lois O'Brien. They were featured in the documentary, The Love Bugs, uh, which was on, uh, still on PBS. And so uh, Charlie was very much in our minds as we were uh, driving west this summer. Um, after a day, our first stop was uh, Missouri, where we met with Ted McRae. Uh, Ted uh, lives in the St. Louis area and has permits for all of the natural areas and state parks uh, in the state. And so it was real handy uh, for us to connect with him. And he was very generous in allowing me to piggyback on his permits. 
And we made several stops in uh, conservation areas in the southern part of the state, including this little patch of sand prairie uh, that is surrounded by uh, uh, agriculture. And one of the things that was uh, very evident as we were driving west is that it is very dry. Um, as you'll see in the next few minutes, we didn't see a drop of rain from Richmond all the way to uh, western uh, New Mexico. Uh, Ted's pretty serious about his collecting, not that we weren't, but uh, he took advantage of a long-handled net and was beating the bushes up high looking for cerambicids and buprestids. Uh, his beating sheet clearly has seen better days, but uh, he's one of those thrifty entomologists that would rather patch something than replace something. So as long as it still works, if it's still uh, uh, functional, then there's no need to fix it. Uh, we spent uh, our first night in Missouri at Holly Ridge and set up our lights. Um, I've sort of gotten lazy uh, this trip. Uh, I set up a, a mercury vapor light along with a black light with just a ground sheet. And thanks to uh, Bob's vehicle, uh, uh, there is a, a converter that was installed by Charlie in this truck and we would just leave the truck idling and plug in a mercury vapor light. So we had an AC source uh, wherever he went. I'd never collected in Missouri before and quickly discovered it wasn't all that much from uh, uh, Virginia. Um, certainly there were a few species to be had that would be found mainly in the western part of the state, but uh, the faunas were very similar. I should mention, even though the focus of our collecting trip were beetles, uh, I'm very interested in cicadas. So I grabbed all the cicadas that I could uh, all along our trip. The next day we visited a, uh, another conservation site in the Ozarks. I've always wanted to go to the Ozarks, uh, not because of the TV show. I wanted to do it before that, but the TV show inspired me even further. But uh, uh, Ted has a regular circuit that he does every few weeks of checking his traps. He has uh, uh, Lingren funnels um, that are baited with uh, ethanol, and he also has uh, hanging traps uh, baited with uh, red wine. And it was at this point that I noticed uh, the license plates. We both, uh, both vehicles had vanity plates. Uh, you can pick out Ted's Mo Bugs. And uh, for those of you not initiated to uh, Bob's plate, that's Master Sifter. Uh, that's for all the uh, uh, leaf litter sifting that Bob does for his uh, weevils. But uh, it was interesting checking these traps. Uh, this one site we visited, it was pretty productive. Certainly had some nice big showy things in the traps, including euphoria and uh, plinthocelium. So it was kind of a treat to see uh, those specimens pop up in these traps. We spent another night or two in um, uh, Missouri, and then we raced across Arkansas and Oklahoma and headed to Wichita Falls, Texas. And honestly, all I knew about Wichita Falls was the album that I dearly love by Pat Metheny and Lyle Mays. So this is my first time in this part of Texas. And initially I wasn't disappointed. We went to uh, Lucy Wichita's far, fall, uh, park, which is right on the Wichita River in Wichita's Falls, which is in Wichita County, and uh, collected some uh, short series of cicadas, this Neotibison superbus, which I think is an aptly named species. It has this beautiful green color. Uh, the beetles were uh, around, but not in great evidence. Uh, as it was still very, very dry. Uh, we had already booked a hotel through hotels.com, so we were all set, and about midnight, we rolled into a Red Roof Inn in Wichita Falls, and uh, Bob went to get some ice, and I wandered in with my one bag and set it on the floor at the foot of the bed, sort of absentmindedly, and then I checked the bed. Um, unbeknownst to uh, Bob, I've been checking hotel beds for about the past 10 years. And my good friend, uh, uh, Deanie Miller, who's a bed bug expert at Virginia Tech, told me once that the best place to look for bed bugs in a hotel room is the part of the bed that has the best view of the television. That's where most people lie. That's the, the best place to look, or at least the first place to look. So that's where I always started my searches. And I was not disappointed in the first 10 years of looking this is the first time I've ever found bed bugs and uh, saw the blood spots on the mattress. There were bed bugs running in all different directions. 
I ran to the foot of the bed, grabbed my bag, put it outside the door, Bob, and I ran back in with a vial to try and catch some for my students in the medical and veterinary entomology class. By that time, uh, there weren't all that many left, but I managed to snag a few, put them in a vial, and Bob came back in and I said, we're not staying here, we've got bed bugs. And I handed him the vial, he turned right around, went to the uh, uh, front desk and he said, uh, listen, we're not staying here. We want our money back. We've got bed bugs. We're both entomologists and we know what we're talking about. And the guy didn't even hesitate. And uh, so he found another hotel. But interestingly, Bob had been looking at the overall ratings for the uh, hotels, but he hadn't checked the actual uh, uh, comments for this particular hotel. And the very first comment he opened uh, just said two words, bed bugs. And when I was doing a little bit of research looking for graphics for this slide, that's when I found this uh, website dedicated to uh, bringing lawsuits against people who have suffered the indignity of bed bugs at Red Roof Inn. So <laughs> let the buyers beware. Uh, the next day, we went out to Mackenzie Dry Lake. Uh, in Texas. This is a locality where Bob had visited uh, several years before and found some really interesting weevils hiding under uh, blocks of mud and, and uh, dried cow chips and that kind of thing. There was a pond right next to uh, the dry lake and it was uh, pretty scummy, uh, but there was a lot of uh, tiger beetle activity and as I walked along, uh, the tiger beetles were so numerous, they looked like flies. There were thousands of them flying along the edge uh, of this uh, little pond. And it had been many, many years since I've seen this many tiger beetles uh, in one place. So it was kind of fun. The, the collector in me really came out. But that particular species was uh, the Western red-bellied tiger beetle, Cisindolidia punctulata. And uh, when we set up our lights that night, uh, several other species of tiger beetles came into the lights and I found additional species that were even more common just walking around on the dry lake itself. And uh, I had for years heard of Wilcox Playa in Arizona being a hotspot for tiger beetles, but I had never visited a place where so great. So this was uh, quite an interesting uh, spot for me. The next day we drove to Monahan Sand Hills State Park. Um, this is a place that I had visited uh, uh, in 1970 when I was a uh, teenager and hadn't been back since. And I always wanted to go. Um, Bob had a connection with um, Ross Winton and Ross is the invertebrate specialist for the entire state of Texas where he oversees uh, the conservation of rare and endangered invertebrates. And um, his uh, 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 intern, who I'm so sorry, I've forgotten her name, really nice woman and very enthusiastic about beetles. And I apologize for forgetting her name. But we spent a couple of days with them as they followed us around Texas. And as it was getting dark, um, uh, as we were waiting for it to get dark, there were cicadas out there. And I was able to capture a few, I believe this is in the genus Diceroprocta. I'm still learning cicadas, so I'm not gonna be rattling off their names too often uh, during this presentation. But uh, the nightlife there at the dunes was not disappointing in spite of how dry it was. And of course, uh, some of the uh, uh, favorites are two species of polyphylla, one of which is endemic to this set of dunes. Uh, an ironclad beetle, a Zopharis, a Morgus route walking around on the dunes, but a taxon that was new to me that was also walking on the sand, it didn't come to the lights, was this little uh, Elaterid agripnus, and this was a species that was described uh, not too long ago, uh, I should say 1970s, that's about 40 years ago, uh, named after uh, Charles Triplehorn, who uh, um, passed away recently, and he apparently collected the uh, initial type series there at uh, Monahans. Uh, the next day we traveled to uh, the Davis Mountains and we stopped at this roadside rest that's figured up in the uh, upper left-hand corner there. There's the vehicle with my tropics net. 
And uh, I had an experience here uh, 40 years ago in my one other visit. I was visiting with Bob Duff. We were stopped here looking for then Plusiotis woodi, now in the genus Chrysina, and uh, weren't finding anything. And I just remember climbing up to the top of those rocks and just sitting there minding my own business. And all of a sudden I hear Bob yell fire. And I looked down and I could see smoke rolling out of the back of the van. And I remember sliding down those rocks as fast as I could, hit the ground running. And uh, Bob was standing at the back of the van pulling stuff out. And I just started grabbing stuff. We didn't see any flames. There was just a lot of smoke. And uh, I grabbed something and it burned me right across the palm of my hand. And it was a net hoop. And to make a long story short, a bare net hoop had crossed the battery terminals in the back of the vehicle, and it just started to burn right through a ream of paper, and that's what was smoldering in the back. We were very lucky that we were right near the vehicle when it happened, and it didn't happen when we had wandered away. I'm sure we would have lost everything. Um, we had permits to collect at Fort Davis State Park, and uh, Bob and I both were very interested in collecting on the uh, walnuts growing along there. Bob, of course, interested in looking for weevils. And he turned me on to this little uh, weevil, Hohonus, that uh, actually feeds on the mistletoe that grows on the uh, 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 walnut. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any of these beetles, but I did find this beetle, uh, Olicacillus. Uh, it's in the family Orsidacinidae. Um, I had never collected this family before, and I've certainly never collected this genus before. And at this moment, um, I'm not able to identify this species. Um, there are two species currently recorded in the United States. I don't doubt that there are others in Mexico and further south. So it's going to take a little more investigation to see if, in fact, this is something that was previously uh, described. Um, Brachystola magna, the uh, plains lubber grasshopper, was out by the thousands. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't move anywhere without them lumbering around in front of you. And you always had to watch where you were going because there were these massive harvester ant nests around. And uh, um, several times I just lumbered right through one of these active nests without really paying attention. Fortunately, I wasn't uh, stung, but you certainly had to pay attention. Of course, one of the things that I wanted to collect and photograph while I was at this site is Chrysina woodi. Uh, this is one of four species of Chrysina found in the United States. Uh, they're out a wee bit earlier uh, than the uh, three species in Arizona, uh, but uh, uh, this species does occur throughout the summer. They're mostly uh, uh, apparently a day active species found on walnut, but occasionally they do come to lights. And I did manage to beat two specimens off walnut trees and two additional species, uh, specimens came in uh, later that night. This is our uh, uh, site at the uh, uh, equine camp. And a number of interesting beetles came into the light. So like I guess I'm interested in all beetles, even though I'm primarily interested in scarabs, but I collected everything uh, that I saw. And there were a number of uh, species that either I had not collected or things I had not seen in the field for uh, nearly 40 years. The next day we drove up to uh, the uh, Guadalupe Mountains National Park where we also had a permit. I just wanna make it plain to everybody that uh, for all the national parks and conservation areas, et cetera, we did have collecting permits to work in these areas. And I was amazed at this area, how much it looks like where I grew up on the fringes of the Mojave Desert, just north of uh, Los Angeles. It's got the junipers. I mean, it's not quite the same uh, plant community, but it's very, very similar. And uh, Bob here is demonstrating his, one of his primary techniques for collecting weevils, and that's putting a beading sheet down. Uh, he told me uh, several times throughout the trip that doing this at night is much more productive than during the day, but it never hurt to whack the bushes whenever we stopped. One of the things I noticed too, is that just like the junipers at home on the north side of the San Gabriels, there was often flagging uh, on the plants. And I'm presuming that it's the uh, uh, juniper girdler, this styloxis bicolor or something darn similar, similar that uh, the larval activity is causing the uh, uh, um, girdling on these plants. We also found a, uh, an acacia um, in bloom uh, in one of the parking lots and they were just swarming with uh, Colignathus discus 
and Lycus arizonensis. Uh, the Coleognathus I'd never collected before. Lycus arizonensis I collected many times in Arizona, but I didn't recognize this species right away because the uh, apical markings on the elytra are very narrow compared to the uh, Arizona populations. And so I was sort of excited at first thinking maybe I'd found something new. But upon uh, returning at home, um, I did a little bit of investigation and found out that the New Mexico, uh, West Texas populations have narrower apical markings. And I extracted the genitalia on both the Arizona and Texas populations that I collected this trip and they're identical. So there you have it. Um, we moved to another area uh, in the park, and uh, it's always fun to see the rainbow grasshoppers out and about. And uh, I found one little scrappy uh, choya all by itself, and uh, there were a couple specimens of Mona Lipa munching away on it. And uh, after extensive searching the rest of the afternoon, I found no other cacti. It's just amazing how these uh, animals get around and find their uh, host. We set up uh, lights in the uh, parking lot. And as we were waiting for it to get dark, we uh, both Bob and I started beating the bushes uh, in the background there looking for uh, Dicozenus. This is a, a genus of weevil that Bob is uh, revising. And we did find a few specimens on the Circocarpus. And also wandering around was this great big Meloid, uh, Epicotta atrovitata. This is a species I've never collected before. Stenomorpha, uh, Tenebrionids were in, in, uh, very common, especially as it got darker. But the highlight of this particular locality was this little tiny um, Tenebrionid, uh, Trichiotis syriatus. And um, I collected it, I recognized it, uh, the tribe right away. <laughs> Uh, thanks to my friendship with uh, Chris Worth. Chris Worth uh, just completed his, uh, successfully completed his doctorate at, uh, at Purdue and is now the collections manager there. And he revised this tribe. And uh, I recognized it as a member of the tribe, but I knew that the genus wasn't familiar to me. And Kojin Kanda kindly identified it for me. And it turns out that it's uh, a very rarely collected species. And uh, we just happened to beat one specimen off Circocarpus. And it turns out that uh, Chuck Triplehorn and others have collected uh, them in the uh, uh, national park there. And as you can see from the distribution map, it also occurs in New Mexico. And uh, in Chris's paper with Aaron Smith, they discovered a couple of records further south in Mexico too. And uh, as I said, there was absolutely no rain. We had planned to spend another week in West Texas and Southern New Mexico, and uh, it was just too dry. There was just no point in spending any time for very little beetle activity. So we kept heading West. And by the time we got to the mountains around Cloudcroft, this is what we encountered. And not only was it raining, but at 8,500 feet in elevation, the temperature had dropped from two days previously from 110 to 55 degrees. I really felt like we were stripping our gears there, but it was quite pleasant, but it was borderline chilly. Um, but we uh, did some beating and uh, took some litter samples. And I found this lone elk leg out in the edge of a meadow. I don't know where the rest of the elk was, but I turned the leg over and we found this uh, sylphid and uh, a trojid there uh, underneath. So that was kind of fun. Uh, both of these species I've collected elsewhere uh, in the Southwest. And that very same day, we ended the day uh, uh, down in the desert. Uh, we were driving along through the, the edge of white sands. And of course, a lot of it's either national park and or uh, military base, and uh, we finally found a spot about 45 minutes outside of Las Cruces where we could pull off the highway and uh, just set up a light. And uh, again, it was very dry, but a number of insects came in, but it, uh, one of the big bruisers that came in was uh, uh, Daryl Brakus. The next day, we decided just to keep going and uh, get to Arizona. So like I say, we arrived there uh, in the Chiricahuas about a week early. I should backtrack just a tiny bit. Um, 
I bought my first uh, smartphone just two weeks before this trip. I think they're the tools of the devil. I always have, and I still do. But the cameras are great, and I enjoy being able to stay in regular touch with my wife. But everything else just reminds me how much I hate them. <laughs> but because of the camera, um, I had more opportunities to take scenery shots and people shots. And uh, I was experimenting a little bit with the macro feature, which I still don't have a handle on. It'll never replace my Canon, but um, I didn't take as many beetle pictures. So I am relying on friends for a lot of the pictures you see or photographs that I've taken in years past. So we moved up into the canyon, Cave Creek, and we spent a couple nights at Cave Creek Ranch. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, with this little hideaway, it's gorgeous. Um, I, I've stayed here a couple of times now, and I just love it. Um, I love being able to uh, work the canyon until the wee hours, and then within a few minutes, you're home. And uh, it's very comfortable, and you can step out. It's a fantastic view. The animals come to you. You're practically having to move all the deer and the coatis and uh, peccaries and other animals as they're going about their business. On the far uh, right there at the top, uh, Bob is uh, working up one of his uh, litter samples. And uh, Andrew and Katie Johnston uh, came out to uh, visit with us and went out collecting with us uh, that night. And we drove out on Foothill Road towards San Simone to this wash that I realized I've been visiting off and on for half a century. And I'm still fascinated by this little strip of uh, uh, real estate and I'm always finding something new. And of course, uh, they'd had some rains there, and it was a big night for hawk moths, especially white line sphinx moths. But I did manage to find some other uh, beetles of interest. It wasn't a big scarab night, but again, uh, really good tiger beetles. And maybe it's just because I have a newfound appreciation for all beetles that I'm noticing these things when I've ignored them in the past. But the uh, one species that I had not collected before is the one on the far right, Brassiella veridisdicta. This is a minute uh, tiger beetle. Um, I don't hold me to any measurements here, but it's, I believe it's one of the smallest species that we have uh, in the United States. And I just inadvertently picked it up. I knew it was a tiger beetle and I just grabbed it and put it in the jar. Next day, um, Bob and I went our separate ways uh, to uh, look for our, our beetles. And uh, I just wandered up the road from Cave Creek Inn. And my goal was to walk to the Southwest Research Station and back, uh, beating the bushes all along the way. The short version is I didn't make it. Um, I ran out of water. It was so hot. I had a three liter camel back and I got just past Sunny Flat Campground when the water ran out and I thought, you know, I really shouldn't do this without water. And I wasn't exactly sure where I was. Uh, there wasn't any signal there, so I couldn't figure out where I was on a map. So, but the trip was uh, very productive. I was out for several hours and got lots of uh, uh, insects that were of interest to me. And again, some things that uh, now that I have more general interests, uh, it was just uh, fun to see them and get some uh, host data. Um, the next day, we headed to the top of the Chiricahuas, Rustler Park, and this is one of those instances that I'm uh, going to share with you all, uh, just a warning to be prepared. Um, if there are taxa that you're interested in collecting, <clears throat> make a note of it and remember that they're there when you're at a spot where they're known. Uh, it was, I had every intention of looking for this beetle, Rustleria obscura. Um, it's the only specimen known. It was found under bark uh, at Rustler's Park uh, under pine. And um, I just blanked out. <laughs> Bob and I were there. It was very lush. The flowers were beautiful. It was nice to get finally out of the rain in the upper left. You can see what chased us all the way up the mountain. And uh, you can also see in the lower right that uh, the severe fire that went through that area toasted most of the pines, but there's still some stands there. I just simply forgot to look for this beetle. So I'm gonna to have to go back and see if uh, I can find another one. Um, but all was not lost. Um, right at the entrance uh, and all along the road at the higher elevation, Ceanothus was in full bloom. And I found that this plant can be very productive. 
and uh, I wasn't disappointed. I got a nice series of Lycus uh, sanguina pennis. This is a species I've only collected in ones and twos, and mainly because I just don't collect at high enough elevations to find them. Uh, several years ago, I went up to Santa Catalina's and collected uh, the first one I've ever picked up. Picked up. Um, but I generally uh, work in the middle and lower elevations, and I'm the lesser for it. So I was glad we got to spend some time at higher elevations. And of course, we're headed toward Gleason on our way to Sierra Vista. And guess what? It's raining again. It was very, very wet. Uh, as we were traveling in southeastern Arizona. In fact, for most of Cochise County, it was soaking. But we did stop at Gleason, another spot where I visited uh, multiple times over the, the years. Uh, it is a well-known ghost town, although not a ghost town proper, because there are people living around there in the area. There's lots of mailboxes. I don't know where they're all living, but they're getting mail. This is the uh, saloon, which I've watched it slowly implode on itself after the last half century, and it's kind of sad, but inevitable. Uh, the reason that I usually stop here is because there's Bumelia growing in this wash right next, to, you can see on the far right, and uh, that's the larval host for Plenthocelium. And they're either found on those trees at the base or they're found on Bacchus. And I found managed to find a couple specimens after almost two decades of nothing. Um, we spent the night in uh, 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 Hereford with uh, Steve Lingefelter and Norm Woodley, who were very kindly uh, put us up for the better part of a week. <laughs> and the next day we visited several spots, but were rained out. We usually would stop for maybe 20 minutes and then a thunderstorm would come up almost out of nowhere. And we'd jump in the car and we would try to drive somewhere else where it wasn't pouring. And this is a wash that we found just uh, uh, west or just north of uh, Tombstone. And um, Bob was hoping to find uh, an undescribed species of uh, polydrusus, uh, which he had some specimens of that he'd been working on, but was hoping for more material to add to the type series. And we weren't disappointed. Um, after beating the uh, uh, acacias, uh, we found a big series of them here. Um, and also, uh, I found a species that was new to me, this Acmeotera uh, bivulneria. I can't talk anymore. I'm in trouble. Uh, but that's a very tiny, yet very distinctive Acmeotera, uh, and I've never seen them before. They're not uncommon, but it was just uh, new to me. That evening, uh, we drove up to... Um, up one of the canyons where we met with Pat Sullivan. Both Bob and I have known Pat for uh, many years. I first met Pat when I was 14 years old at Devil's Punch Bowl County Park uh, in Los Angeles County. And it uh, just so happened that my neighbor was the ranger at the county park. And uh, even at my tender young age of 13, 14 years old, he knew of my interest in insects and he stopped by and he said, hey, there's some guys that are coming up to the park to look for beetles and pack rat nests, and maybe you'd like to meet them. So uh, my parents drove me to the park, and the next day I met Pat, I met Frank Avor, and I met Dave Marqua, and uh, that meeting has always stuck with me. However, Pat has no recollection of this. Uh, he remembers meeting me somewhere else at another time, so who knows? But um, as I said, Bob's always generous uh, with his expertise in looking at uh, weevils and uh, is always happy to look at collections and, and make identifications. Uh, Pat is slowly in the process of um, uh, donating his collection to ASU. And um, uh, I just happened to mention to him that I was interested in cicadas. And he said, well, you know, I have some cicadas that I don't have any use for. And uh, the indoor collecting was fantastic for cicadas that night. Uh, Pat's very well traveled uh, throughout uh, the New World and uh, Southeast Asia and had some wonderful material, many new, new genera uh, to my collection. The next day we drove uh, uh, east of uh, Douglas and uh, this was my uh, third time uh, driving along this abomination that we have along our border. And um, 
All I can say is, is that I have no doubt that our descendants will be shaking their heads wondering what the hell we thought we were doing. That said, uh, we continued along this road toward the Arizona, New Mexico border and uh, started beating this little uh, fabiaceous plant whose name escapes me at the moment, but it got a nice series of this Agrilus cavatus. Um, Norm Woodley put me onto this. And up on the hillside were a number of agaves. And for years I'd collected uh, Peltiphorus polymitis, and, uh, but I'd always overlooked a second, uh, more so, less seldom collected species, uh, Peltiphorus adustus. And so I made a concerted effort to look for this second species and I wasn't disappointed. I managed to find both species on the plant. Adustus tends to be higher on the plants, whereas uh, polymitis tends to be lower. So while I was working up on the hillside uh, on the agaves, um, Norm and uh, Bob were working down below where we had the car parked. And for the past couple of weeks, you know, Bob and I have been exchanging dark oaths when we miss a good specimen or do something stupid. And there were a lot of expletives and sarcasm and so on. But something was different when I heard Bob say, oh, no, I screwed up. And my first thought was snake. And that's exactly what happened. Bob said that he felt something soft and squishy under his foot <laughs> and jumped back and a black-tailed rattlesnake went one direction and Bob went the other direction and no vertebrates were harmed in this encounter. But uh, let that be a lesson to all of us. I, I, in a way, I was sort of glad it happened because it made me a lot more alert. I'm afraid I was a little bit casual the first couple of weeks of the trip and was just darn lucky. So I encountered a number of uh, interesting insects in this area. I found one plenthocelium just flying through the air at one of these spots. Uh, found a larva of a viceroy and uh, uh, one of the only, I think the third or fourth specimen of Aleus zunianus that I've ever collected. Uh, actually, I think Bob found it on a tree or maybe it was Norm, I think found it on an oak tree that I've been walking by several times. So it pays to have lots of eyes on something. On the way back to Douglas, we stopped along a wash that's a favorite spot of both Norm and Steve Lingafelters because they find good things on the uh, Bacchus. And uh, initially, you know, we found the usual stuff, mantises and, you know, Korean bugs and that kind of thing. But then I started finding some sapping spots. And Plinthocelium is also known at this locality, but this is the first time I'd seen Dendrobius on sapping spots in many, many years accompanied by Catinus. So that was kind of fun. That evening, we had a lovely dinner at the uh, Gadsden Hotel in Douglas. And uh, this is a very historic hotel, as you can tell from the interiors, they just don't build them like this anymore. And that night, we drove out back uh, toward the New Mexico border and stopped at a wash a little closer to town. And as you can see from the uh, night sky there, this, this night's not gonna last very long. It's the, the storm uh, is coming, the lightning is incredible. And those little purple lights that you see along the way are these LED pop-up lights that I took along this trip. And I did a lot of black lighting with these lights. Uh, it's an LED party light that I have in a food container that works as a diffuser and also keeps the bugs out of the lights themselves. They're not sealed. And then just to give it a more uh, vertical apparency, I uh, tried these uh, laundry baskets that are made by Ikea and they work really well. I can't attest to the wavelength of the lights uh, in terms of what they attract versus the upright sheets. There's nothing better than an upright sheet. I'll just say that right now. But if you're looking to get a lot of light traps out in a hurry, um, this is one consideration, at least in temperate areas. This is not something I would do where you know it's going to be pouring rain all the time. The next day, we drove over uh, Montezuma Pass uh, over to the west side of the uh, Huachucas. This is one of my very favorite vistas looking southeast toward uh, Mexico. And 180 degrees behind us, is uh, you can see Copper Canyon here, the big canyon that's off to the right. Copper Canyon is a popular collecting place for people who are interested in all kinds of groups. And if they're, the right shrubs are in bloom, it can be pretty spectacular. And we weren't disappointed. 
Uh, the mimosa was in bloom, and I got a good series of uh, several species of cerambicids and uh, uh, chrysomelids, just to mention a few. And we uh, drove uh, along the western slopes of the Huachucas for a bit longer. I've always enjoyed looking uh, and collecting in the grasslands there. It's not incredibly diverse, but what you find there is different than what you're going to find anywhere else in the state. And uh, it was incredible to see this massive storm building up over uh, Mexico. That night, we set up some blacklight traps up at the top of uh, Miller Canyon. This too is a place I've been visiting for uh, many years. It's one of the handful of sites in southeastern Arizona where you can collect all three species of uh, Chrysina. And we certainly weren't uh, disappointed this evening. The next day, we drove up to the top of uh, 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 Car Canyon uh, and uh, did some beating and collecting. Margarita Brummerman uh, joined us with her dog Kia and uh, Kira, excuse me. And here you can see Bob popping up out of the Manzanitas there. Uh, like you say, they don't call him Master Sifter for nothing. Every chance he had to grab a litter sample from a different species of plant, he did. And uh, apparently uh, this particular sampling site was productive. He hit one of the weevils that he was looking for, something that's uh, seldom collected. The next day was sort of a day off. Um, I was way behind on my specimen preparation and uh, staying with Steve and Norm was pretty darn comfortable. So uh, I enjoyed my coffee. I worked up uh, uh, some of my pin specimens, most of the material I kept in alcohol this trip. Um, I ordered coffee for my wife in Richmond, <laughs> caught up with her on the phone, and sort of rested up for the evening's activities. Steve had organized a blacklight night in Ida Canyon uh, on the west side of the uh, Huachucas, a place that uh, I had never blacklighted before. And there were uh, people from all over California, Arizona, and even as far north as Utah that came down uh, for this event and set up these massive lights, uh, often for moths, but other insects too. And I got a chance to see my good friend, Alex Dwen, who I think is in the audience with us. He's a, a longtime Lorquin member too. I've known him since he was a very young member of the society. And Jonathan Quist, who I know only by reputation, a collector from Utah. And then also, this was the first chance this trip I had to uh, see um, uh, Bill Warner. Bill and I have been uh, corresponding uh, since we were teenagers and, and trading specimens back in the day. This was also one of my first opportunities to meet Salvador Vitanza, who's a superb photographer and contributed a number of images to Beatles of Western North America. There he is standing next to his light, and that's his license plate. I always try to photograph vanity plates that are entomologically pertinent when I can. Um, the next day, uh, Bob and I left the comfort of uh, Hereford and headed back over Montezuma Pass and along the western slopes of the Huachucas for the Patagonia Mountains in the distance. And as we did every day, it was a matter of dodging rain. Uh, you never want to complain about rain because it's a part of the world that needs it, but uh, it was wet. And uh, when we got to uh, Nogales, this is what we encountered. And uh, we were getting constant warnings on our smartphones saying, if you're indoors, stay indoors, don't leave, don't get on the road unless you've been ordered to evacuate. So we opted to stay in that night. The next day it was all sunshine and both of us were feeling great and I couldn't uh, pass up this opportunity to pose with big arts. Honestly, I don't know what big arts is. I assume it's a fast food place, but I don't know that. They weren't open for business, but this was in Nogales and we headed over to uh, Pina Blanca Lake, which is a place that I've always enjoyed collecting. And as I was standing on the boat ramp, I noticed there was some dung beetle activity right at my feet. This little Canthon indigasius was uh, rolling this ball of dung and I started looking around and there were several of these beetles uh, rolling dung up the boat ramp. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I haven't noticed any cattle or anything around here. And that's when I noticed the big pile of toilet paper and human feces right off the side of the boat ramp. Um, a couple of days later, 
we join forces again with Margarita Brummerman and uh, Margarita introduced me to Montosa Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains a few years ago. The upper right is uh, looking down the road that's leaving Montosa Canyon heading up toward Mount Hopkins. Uh, Mount Hopkins is the site of the uh, uh, Whipple Observatory operated by the Smithsonian. And uh, if you look to the right of that sign, you will see Mount Wrightson, which I believe is the third highest peak uh, in uh, Arizona. And of course, to the left and on the other side is uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, beginnings of Madera Canyon. So we set up our lights down below. And uh, for some reason, I was feeling expansive and decided to set up our upright sheet. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a great night, uh, nothing incredibly unusual for me. Uh, typically, again, what we did is we set up a mercury vapor light and a black light. Um, this is something that a lot of people have been doing for years. Um, I just never have an opportunity to run a mercury vapor light when I'm out, but uh, we often uh, ran both lights and then we turn off the mercury vapor light uh, just as we we're getting ready to shut down for and for the last 45 minutes or so just having the black light on would seem to concentrate all the material that was out and about in the bushes and past the shadows and it really seems to to, to work well again i know this is a system that a lot of people use the next day was not a field day we stopped by the university of arizona um, Bob did a six-month sabbatical there a few years ago, working on several uh, weevil-related projects. And uh, there we met with uh, uh, um, Wendy Moore and um, uh, Jean Hall. And on the far right is uh, uh, Chip uh, uh, Hedgecock. And I've known Chip for many years through a, a now-defunct organization known as Sonor and Sar Sonor Arthropod Studies Institute. And uh, this is during my insect zoo days. And I met Chip then, and Chip is a superb photographer. And he contributed a number of images to uh, the Western Beetle book. Uh, and he's also been taking part in these uh, 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 natural history surveys in Sonora and photographing specimens that are part of the uh, survey efforts there. So it was uh, great to spend some time with them. Uh, that evening, we took it easy and uh, spent the night at Margarita Brummerman's place, uh, painted rocks just outside of, uh, um, uh, uh, or picture rocks, I always make that mistake, uh, just outside of uh, Tucson. And we set up the lights right in her driveway. You can see the uh, saguaro there off in the distance. And again, it was very dry. The moment we got to Tucson, everything dried up. It was, it was amazing to see how lush everything had been the last several days. And the moment we left the Santa Rita's and started heading north, it was just bone dry again. Of course, that's changed now. And uh, two weeks after we left, uh, this area was covered with carpets of flowers. So, you know, timing is, is everything. The next day, we headed up to uh, uh, the Phoenix area, where we spent several days at ASU's uh, natural history collections. This is uh, a site that is off campus, which makes it very convenient for parking. And uh, all their natural history collections are there, including their invertebrate collections. And one of the many interesting things about this facility is, is that this is also the collection site for NSF's uh, NEON project. Um, this is a a series of surveys that have been ongoing. It uh, was designed to go 30 years to collect uh, key taxa. And then all of those specimens are sent to uh, this facility in ASU. And uh, Andrew Johnston is in charge of the invertebrate collections there and uh, sort of gave us a tour of the facilities. And it's massive, it's just massive. And there's an incredible amount of material there. And uh, parts of it, I, I'm not very well versed on the collection, so I, I can't say much about it, but you can go to the NEON uh, website and you can find uh, material where the data is available online and there are other tools that you can use as well. And so if this is something of, of interest uh, uh, to some of you, you might want to check that out. It's well worth it, but it was a very impressive facility. And of course, the uh, other reason that we were here is because Bob wanted to examine uh, Charlie's uh, weevil collection, which was deposited here. Uh, Charlie sadly 
departed this life a few years ago, but his wife Lois is still with us. Uh, Lois was uh, uh, an expert on fulgorids, and her collection is here as, uh, as well. And so Bob uh, spent three days going through, combing through the collection, uh, looking to repatriate some loans uh, that were just sort of languishing there at the collection, as well as looking for uh, new taxa that he was aware of, new genera and species uh, that he wants to get published before finishing up the Weevil chapter that's going to appear in Beetles of Canada and the United States. The sculpture is of a, uh, I believe it's a sand treader uh, cricket. Um, I think it's some sort of, a, it's not paper mache, it's this sort of plasticky thing, but it's huge. Um, uh, it's at least half my size. While I was in town, I got to spend some quality time with my good friend, Christina Francois. Uh, she completed her doctorate in entomology at the University of Arizona a few years ago, studying polymorphism in the caterpillars of Hylis lineata. And um, uh, I first met Christina when she was 16 years old. Um, she called me out of the blue at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. And her school project was to find a job that seemed cool, find somebody who's doing it, and then shadow them for a day. And she thought being an insect zoo director would be cool. So she called and I said, sure, come on out. So she and her mother turned up just happened to be on my birthday. <clears throat> and uh, she's not missed one of my birthdays since. It's been since 1997. When we were living in the same town, more or less, I got cookies. And since then, cards, email, uh, phone call, whatever. She's never missed a birthday. But I'm very proud of her uh, accomplishments. And I'm glad we got to spend some time together. And when we were in Scottsdale, we found this bizarre <laughs> beetle-inspired sculpture for the life of me. I don't know the genesis of this, but uh, it definitely has elytra and antennae, so there you have it. Um, after uh, three days of working in the collections and exploring some of the mountain ranges uh, west of uh, Phoenix, uh, we headed uh, north and east toward Sholo to visit with our good friend uh, Rich Cunningham, both Bob and I have known Rich for many years. Rich is uh, uh, quite the scarab collector. And uh, for the first time, he now has a real uh, collection room. It's uh, for years, his collection was in an unfinished base basement wrapped with uh, sheets of plastic to keep the dust out. But now he has a real space. And Rich is in the process of donating chunks of his collection to ASU. ASU seems to be the place to donate collections these days. Uh, their collections growing in, in leaps and bounds and they're getting some important uh, collections from the, the West. And I think this is a good thing. Um, luckily for me, Rich had not parted with his Melolonthine collection yet, which is the subfamily of scarabs that I work in. And uh, so the indoor collecting for me was pretty darn good. Uh, and it was interesting to note that of uh, the several hundred specimens that I came home with, probably a quarter of them were specimens I gave to Rich about 35 years ago. So this is the second set of scarabs that I've distributed to people that have uh, come back home. But uh, he also had weevils. Rich had been saving weevils for Charlie O'Brien. Uh, for years. And with Charlie gone, uh, the weevils were just piling up. And so he turned those over to Bob, uh, for which he was very grateful. And I just casually mentioned my interest in cicadas. And guess what? Rich had some cicadas too. So this was a very profitable stop. So packed with all of our specimens, things we had collected ourselves and uh, things that we had gleaned from our generous friends, uh, we began our uh, uh, heading back uh, east and our last stop um, was just south of Las Vegas, um, New Mexico, where I collected a uh, long series of uh, Orizabas, or excuse me, a phone, uh, Orizabas, um, which uh, the name escapes me at the moment, Piriformis, I think it is, which I did not take a picture of, but I just happened to notice the authors of this fine publication in the audience. So I want to plug their book. Thanks to this book, I was able to identify uh, that particular species and, and more. Um, that night we spent, uh, uh, we got a hotel in Las Vegas, <clears throat> uh, New Mexico, 
And for those of you that are familiar with the television show Longmire, uh, Las Vegas was the site where they filmed the office uh, for the sheriff's office for Absaroka County, Wyoming. And uh, all of a sudden it dawned on me that we were right there and we were just minutes away. So with very little arm twisting, I convinced Bob to, that we needed to spend a few minutes just being tourists. And uh, I have to admit, it was kind of fun. There are very few things like this that I would do, but this is the one thing that uh, uh, was fun. And I rewatched the entire series uh, just recently and enjoyed it just as much this time as I did the past five times. From Las Vegas, we headed over to Wichita, Kansas. Um, I've never set foot in Kansas before. And uh, Mary Liz Jameson, who I've known for years, I have met her when she was 19 years old and uh, just starting out uh, with Brett Ratcliffe. And I had come home for a brief uh, intermission from my stint in South Africa. And uh, we've been corresponding off and on ever since. And uh, when she heard that we were headed uh, out west, she said, well, if you're coming through Wichita, please come by and stay with us. And so we called her bluff. And she organized a trip for us out in some university land just outside of Wichita. And uh, I collected a number of uh, Midwestern specialties that I had never picked up before. Some things I was familiar with, some things not, but I uh, added several new species of cicadas. And by this time, Bob had noted that I was collecting everything. You know, I was going way beyond scarabs, collecting all beetles, and now I'm collecting bugs. But in my defense, I was picking up all triatoma because that's something that's of interest to me and that I share with my students in medical and veterinary entomology. And the uh, uh, last uh, uh, night out, um, we stopped in St. Louis on the way home, and it just seemed to make sense that we started out with Ted McRae. Why not finish with Ted McRae? So we had a real nice dinner uh, together and uh, 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 exchanged a few more specimens, and then we were um, on our way. So thanks to timing, I haven't had much of the opportunity to uh, prepare all the specimens that I collected. Um, so far, I think I've mounted and labeled, I've mounted about a quarter of what I collected and I just got it labeled and now I've started the next quarter of specimens, just getting them mounted. But I wanna say, and, and Bob mentioned this to me earlier today when we were uh, communicating that, yes, we visited a lot of places that people go to all the time. We are visiting places in a region of the United States, certainly, that's one of the most intensely uh, collected places uh, in the world. And yet, um, we are adding new records. We are finding undescribed taxa. And I have to say that now that my search has broadened to include not only scarabs, but all beetles, um, I'm finding things that are at least new to me. I'm still learning. And as I mentioned, we found a couple of specimens along the way that we don't know what they are. And uh, you know, we might find they're described down the road. They might be a new record uh, uh, in the country. It might be a new state record. We don't know yet. It's at the very least right now, some of these things are certainly new to me. Um, if you're inspired at all uh, to learn more about beetles in Western North America, I recommend my book, uh, Beetles of Western North America that came out last year. It's published through Princeton, but you can order it anywhere. And uh, if you uh, like to support uh, independent booksellers, I encourage you to do so. Uh, this is a plug for my next book, uh, The Lives of Beetles, A Natural History of Coleoptera. This is a, a book that will also be coming out with Princeton. It's of a, a general interest book, but it's profusely illustrated. I peeled out some of the pages from the review uh, files that I went through. It'll be out in March of uh, 2023, and it looks at beetles from several different um, directions. And so if you're looking for a colorful uh, introduction to the world's most diverse group of animals, this uh, publication might be for you. Um, thank you all so much for uh, joining uh, Bob and I on this most excellent adventure. Thanks, Art. That was excellent. Well, actually, I maybe I should. Uh, am I coming through? 
Yes. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I should say that uh, you have just set the bar for presentations so high that I'm, we may never get another presentation from anybody I, again. I, I think you're being very kind, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, it's all it's all because of this darn thing. You know, I hate them. But when it comes to being able to take a decent picture right now of, of anything but an insect, they're fabulous. I mean, I had a, a Canon power shot that it was hit or miss for me. I still had to know to, how to take a picture sometimes. And that's where I fell flat every time. But this thing is art proof. It truly is. Yeah, my I've seen some uh, some of the uh, Apple uh, cell phones um, that were... Uh, the, some of them were excellent photography. I've seen some really impressive pictures coming out of some of them. Mine is a little mediocre, but yeah, there's some really good ones out there. Um, well, to, to be honest, what got me, there were several steps that got me thinking about this. My wife has been bugging me for years to get a smartphone because she was hoping to upgrade hers. And I just said, no, I'm not interested. And, um, and then I noticed that Ted McRae's uh, blog, Beetles in the Bush, almost all of his images now are using a smartphone. And um, all of the pictures are much better than I ever thought possible. And that's when I began thinking about the possibilities. And I just stumbled into the video part by accident. <laughs> and I started taking videos along the way. And I thought, Am I ever going to look at these again? But, you know, a little 10 seconds of little snippets of road here and there or a storm. I enjoy looking at them and I find myself going back. I, I never thought it would be that would be me. But here I am. Yeah, I fought I fought getting a, a smartphone for a long time. Uh, and when I started doing using it and texting and found out that it's uh interesting and now it's requirement because i'm getting texts all day long from customers and things so uh, it becomes important uh so thank you very much that was impressive excellent i'm 